Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesse. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have such talent. And I praise God for that. Thank you for this children's story, Debbie. I love that story. I've heard it ever since I was a kid. It has a wonderful lesson in that story for all of us. Again, good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. We may be short in numbers, but we are strong in heart this morning. Amen? Amen. It's good to be up here this morning. I, like Larry, a couple weeks ago, had that same feeling that he has, that it's an honor and privilege, and, and I don't take it lightly, lightly, like Larry said, he doesn't take it lightly to stand up here before you. And uh, I enjoy all of our elders speaking, and I always take something away from them. And I uh, just want you to know we put our all into it. And... Uh, that's why we don't take it lightly. Uh, I say this often, but I continue to want to say it just as a reminder to myself and to you that I'll be preaching this sermon to myself more so than anything. So uh, let's just make sure we always keep that in mind. Uh, I'm preaching to myself as well. So with that, let's start with a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you this morning for that blessed assurance. Yeah. Thank you, Father, that we can have that assurance in you, Jesus. And Lord, as we open your word this morning, and the words you've placed on my heart, Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross. Because I want these folks and our viewers online to see you, Christ, and you, God. And you, Holy Spirit, it's these things I pray in your wonderful and holy and blessed name. Amen. Some of you have, may have heard of the late Jim Valvano. He was a basketball coach at North Carolina State University for many years. And he was diagnosed with cancer. Short bef shortly before he passed, he gave a stirring message at an awards banquet. Jimmy V, as he was affectionately known as, said, don't give up, don't ever give up. And he was saying this with cancer all throughout his body. And he challenged everyone that no matter what they were facing, to never give up, never give up. While I don't know that Jimmy V was an especially spiritual man, but I do think that his message can be applied spiritually. Yeah. I'd like to start this morning with a story from the Bible. And I did not do PowerPoint, please forgive me, but we're going to open our words anyway. We're going to start in the book of Mark. This story is in all four gospels, or it's in three out of the four gospels, but we're going to look at it through the eyes of Mark. Mark chapter 5 and we're going to start in verse 25. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Here we find the story of Jesus raising Jairus' daughter back to life. However, the story I want to focus on is the woman who had the issue of blood. Now, I can't say I completely understand what this lady was going through, although I do feel sorry for her, what she had to go through. This poor lady didn't have to just go through this once. She went through it for 12 long years. I'm sure that makes many of us cringe to even think about. She had tried to get help from doctors. And you would assume that you could trust doctors, but they only made her worse. Have you ever been to the doctor and came out worse? That would make most of us mad, wouldn't it? Not only did they make her worse, they took her money as well. She had spent all her money on doctors trying to get a cure for her problem. Every last shekel she had probably spent. 
I kind of imagine maybe she was already homeless, maybe. And maybe she was just about out of hope. For she had exhausted all her earthly means to be healed. And we see how it turned out. While probably waiting around and wishing she would just die, she had heard, started hearing stories from people about people being healed by Jesus. And after hearing these stories, she became encouraged again and wanted to go see Jesus. Ellen White says she felt assured that if she could only go to him, she would be healed. So for her to get up and to go where Jesus was probably took a lot of effort on her part. Don't you think? Losing blood takes away a lot of strength. And every ounce of energy she could muster, it probably took for her to go see Jesus. So when she came to where Jesus was, there was a big crowd. And so she tried to press through the crowd. Can you imagine the strength it took her to try to get through the crowd? To get to see Jesus. Have you ever tried to press through a crowd? Maybe it was the day after Thanksgiving, and you were trying to get that new portable microwave that runs on batteries on sale for $9.99. Or maybe when you were younger, or I, I'm sorry, when I was younger, I used to try to go to baseball games and try to get autographs. And to say that was crazy is to, an understatement. It's just a bunch of mad people trying to rush to, to that person to get an autograph. And I could care less about that right now. Um, so maybe you can get this picture of what this was like. Maybe you've been to the state fair. Anybody been to the state fair? And you've seen how it can be so crowded. And maybe you're on one side and you see the other side. And you've got to get over there to the other side to get the deep fried veggie links. <laughs> so you make your way without losing your family to the other side. I think you get the, the picture of what a cr this crowd might have looked like. So this lady was trying in vain to reach the Savior. It would have been very easy, I think, for her to say, Oh, well, it's of no use. I can't reach him. It's taking too much effort. And I don't feel good and I can't go on. But listen, folks, she did not give up. She continued to press on and try to reach Jesus. As the crowd was moving, because they were moving towards Jairus' house, to, this lady continued to push through to try to get to the great physician. Then being close to him, and, and being confusion, and maybe with her fighting just to get to him, maybe she forgot what she was going to say. I'm not sure. But you might know how it is. You want to talk to someone or tell them something really important, and then when the time comes, you go blank. And you feel helpless as to what was going on or what to say because of the effort that you spent to get it, of getting to that point. Well, this crowd was moving, and obviously the woman was very tired, and there was a lot of commotion and confusion. So she saw Jesus, and as he passed, she realized that she was about to lose her only chance to being healed. And then she spoke to herself these famous words. She said, If I may only touch his clothes, I may be well. What faith of this dear woman. I firmly believe the Holy Spirit was working on her and encouraging her to do all that she could because I'm sure it was not very easy, as I've said. And everyone would have understood if she had just given up. But she didn't. So in that instant, as Jesus was passing, she reached out. And maybe she was lying on the ground. I know you can visualize it with me. Maybe she was lying at the, on the ground with people all around her. She reached out and succeeded in barely touching the border of his garment. Ellen White says this in The Desire of Ages. 
Now, I used to play flag football when I was in college, and uh, flag football is basically flags tied around your waist, and you have to pull them when someone has the ball instead of physically tackling them. And I can remember many times playing flag football and someone running by me with the ball and barely touching the flag, but not pulling it, but barely touching it. But that wasn't good enough for me to barely touch it. But it was barely, but barely touching it was good enough for this dear woman. In that moment, she touched his garment. She was made whole again. And new life flowed through her body. Ellen White says, In that one moment, she knew that she was healed. In that one touch of concentrated faith, her, of her, the one concentrated faith of her life, and instantly her pain and feebleness grew to the vigor of perfect health. She then tried to withdraw from the crowd, probably not wanting to make a scene. Her, her heart was probably overflowing with joy and thankfulness. But sometimes withdrawing from the crowd can be just as tough as getting through the crowd. Amen? As the crowd was moving, Jesus suddenly stops. And I can hear many people possibly saying, Whoa, why did we stop? Maybe some accidentally ran into each other. Maybe some thought that Jesus was going to heal someone again because he had actually been doing quite a few healings along the road. So when everybody finally stopped, Jesus spoke above the crowd so everyone could hear him. And he said, who touched me? Can you imagine with me being in those places we talked about, the state fair the day after Thanksgiving or getting autographs, someone saying above the crowd, who touched me? Would you not look at them indignantly? Indignant? Would you look at them like they were crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure many people in the crowd were saying the same thing. And we see Peter speaking up, who was never shy about speaking up. He was always ready to speak. He said, Master, the multitude throng at you and press thee on every side. And thou sayest, who touched me? Basically, Peter was saying, really, Lord? How can you ask who touched you when you're in the middle of all these people? But Jesus quickly verifies what he means when he says, Someone has touched me, for I, per I have perceived that virtue has gone out of me. Jesus knew the difference, and he could feel the difference between a casual touch and the touch of faith, especially when healing came out of him. This was something that had to be recognized. This is why Jesus stopped. And it was a wonderful teaching moment that could not pass without everyone hearing it. The woman who was trying to leave found herself trembling at Jesus' feet. No better place to be than at Jesus' feet. Amen? Well, this dear lady, she didn't know what to expect. Maybe Jesus would be upset. Maybe he would scold her. We, she didn't know. So she tearfully shares her whole story to Jesus and also the crowd around her. She probably didn't want the whole crowd around her to know, but they ended up hearing it. She told how she had spent all her money on doctors and how they had made her worse. How she had spent all her energy to get him and how she was only able to touch the border of his garment. Jesus then responds in a gentle and loving way. And I want you to hear how he responds to her. He says, daughter. What a wonderful choice of what to call this woman. He didn't say lady or woman. He said daughter. It reminds me of when Judas betrayed Jesus and he said friend. Jesus always had the right answer, didn't he? Amen. So he says, daughter, be of good comfort. I can just see him smiling, can't you? Thy faith has made thee whole. 
Go in peace. It was important to all those around Jesus following him that they knew what faith this lady had. And that it wasn't just touching his garment. But the faith that this woman had made that had made her completely healed. This story has many lessons. But for me, it's a huge thing that this woman never gave up. Despite her circumstances, she never gave up trying to get to Jesus. She was down to her last straw, as many of us can attest to. That's when we most turn to Jesus, when we're totally out of options. Let's learn together to put our faith and trust in Jesus at the first sign of things going bad. Or maybe when things are hunky-dory. I want to encourage you this morning to not give up the fight. We are getting closer and closer every day to Christ's second coming. And this is not a time to give up, folks. Praise God, Jesus doesn't give up on us. Amen? Amen? I'm so happy that God didn't give up on Jesus when he saw him hanging on the cross for our sins and the Father had to withdraw because all God saw were the sins of the entire human race. And that's why Christ cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, 46. But being in the tomb Friday evening and all day Sabbath and then early Sunday morning, God the Father, I'm sure, said, Go awake, my son. Aren't you so glad he did? I sure am, because the victory had been won by Jesus. And because of his death, we have the opportunity at eternal life. There are many stories that have this theme of not giving up throughout the Bible. Think of Noah. He preached for 40 years. That's longer than I've been alive. 40 years before it rained. And get this, he didn't know what rain was, but he was preaching about it every day for 40 years. Similarly, we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we preach Christ's coming, but we haven't seen it. But we believe in it. Amen? Amen. Did God give up on Adam and Eve after they ate the forbidden fruit? Praise God, no. Did God give up on David or Peter or any of the disciples? How easy would it have been for us to give up on them? especially the disciples. Before Pentecost, they were hungry for power and selfish. Amen? Amen. And well, the, the disciples just didn't seem to get what Jesus was all about. So it would be easy in our minds for, for Jesus to give up on the disciples. But he didn't. Praise God. Maybe you've heard this list before about people who had problems in the Bible. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossiper. Martha was a warrior. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was moody. Moses stuttered. Zacchaeus was short. Abraham was old. And Lazarus was dead. But even with all these bad things, they were not given up on by God. Or Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. They weren't given up on any of them. And it's amazing how God uses people who have problems and who aren't perfect and who have a past. Friends, God qualifies the called. All these folks had powerful roles for Christ and he never gave up on them. I think this should give us courage. We don't have to be perfect to come to Christ. 
So many folks say, well, I need to get my life right before I come to church, or I need to get my life right before I have a relationship with Jesus. But Christ is saying, come just as you are. We also need to remember that the church is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, He will not leave you nor forsake you. And if once wasn't enough, again in verse 8 he says, He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. I want to say to all those who have heard all your life, like I have, the saying, Jesus is coming soon. Maybe you've heard it so much that you're sick of hearing it. Or maybe you don't believe it anymore. To you, I would say, please don't give up. Because one day, He is coming. And I believe that with all my heart. And you know that none of us are guaranteed one moment or one day. Also, it's helpful to read and reread 2 Peter 3, verse 9, which says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. And what is that promise? John 14, 1, 2, 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Beautiful promise. So the, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise in John 14, 1, 2, 3. As some count slackness, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Friends, you probably, are you having problems with your children or your parents or your spouse or your siblings or your relatives or anyone you love? Don't give up on them. Keep on praying for them and placing them at the feet of Jesus. Keep on living up to the light that God has given you to live and to keep doing it and doing it even when you don't see results or did get discouraged. Don't give up. Jabe and Patty, do you guys give up if you, if you get a no when you knock at a door? Do you just give up? No. It, it was going to be impossible. You would not be literature evangelist if you gave up. If you got a no or, or a slam in the door. Willie, when you give estimates, if, you say, if someone says, no, I can't afford it or I can't do it right now, do you give up? You guys would be broke if you gave up. Dan, when you're doing accounting and you get the numbers wrong, do you give up? You, you can't do that. You don't get any numbers wrong. Well, there you go. He doesn't get any numbers wrong. Praise the Lord. We can't give up, friends. God is near and He hears, and more importantly, He cares. He cares more about our loved ones than we do. Isn't that hard to fathom? We love our loved ones pretty, pretty much, pretty special. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, as we've kind of been implying. And in Galatians 5, and 23, it lists the fruits of the Spirit. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is long-suffering. Do you know what long-suffering means to me? Not giving up. The Trinity doesn't give up on me when we have the fruits of the Spirit. And we shouldn't give up on others when we have the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians, all, uh, Galatians also says in chapter 6, verse 9, Let us not grow weary in, while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Amen. This is a promise we can always take Christ as word. When things don't seem to be going right at work or he, even here at the church, or we can't seem why it's all worth it. I promise you it is. 
Right now we may see through a glass darkly. But one day we shall see it clearly. Amen? Amen. I want to add a little footnote this morning. Anybody know what fine print means? <laughs> Things they don't want you to see. Yeah. The fine print is always usually bad news. Maybe you see fine print like free or a, a, an advertisement that says free tires. And the fine print reads with the purchase of four tires. <laughs> then you say, oh, I see now. Or how about the fine print for medication? Oh, this will heal you and you'll be happy. But the possible side effects are awful. Loss of hearing, loss of appetite, loss of life. <laughs> Do any of these things just make you want to say, I'd rather have the initial problem than to deal with these possible side effects? Anyways, my point is, this may be a great rah-rah type of sermon, but I do have some fine print I feel compelled to share. Friends, there are things that we need to give up. Am I right? Amen, Amen or ouch? I found a lot of strength for this from a very wise man named Solomon. His book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, in verses 1 through 8. Listen to these Listen to this while I read it and see if you don't see it as well as I do. To everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. I think it'd be very easy to add or imply here a time to give up and a time to not give up. Look at your own life and ask God what it is I need to give up. Maybe it's procrastination or negativity or gossip or smoking or drinking or cursing or swearing or pornography or worry or doubt or criticism. Maybe it's like me. Maybe it's your cell phone or Facebook, or sports, whatever, those are mine. You know what it is. I don't need to tell you. And if you don't know, I promise you God will tell you. But more important than Him telling you, He will help you give up whatever it is you need to give up. I promise you. And my promises are weak, but God's promises you can count on every day. Philippians 4.13, we all know it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not some, all. And there, I found this wonderful text I have to share with you as well. It's in the book of Proverbs. Again, the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon. Proverbs 24, 16. A righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. So my question is, why does this man, this righteous man or woman continue to fall? Because he keeps, or she keeps getting up. He or she rises again, the verse says. It's a powerful statement. When we fail our friends or our family or our church or more importantly God, when we sin, we have to keep getting up. And not give up the fight against the powers of darkness. We keep getting up in our walk with Jesus. 
even when it seems hard and we can't understand. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Keep getting up. Keep on keeping on with Jesus. You won't regret it. God always keeps his promises. I'd like to share a story with you now. Several years ago, in Turkey, they suffered a terrible earthquake. Many small villages were de devastated by the sh shock. In one small village lived a man and his son, Armand. On the day of the quake, Armand went off to school, as he had so many other times, so many other mornings. His dad told him as he left, after school today, I'll come and pick you up. I'll come for you. When the quake hit, the whole village was de demolished, including the school. It was a brick structure which integrated, dis, dis, disintegrated, sorry, and collapsed into a pile of rubble. Armand's father was terror stricken and ran to the school to find his son. Knowing his son was buried in the rubble at the school, Armand's father joined the entire town in yanking off bricks and other fallen debris. They were desperate to reach the children who were buried there. For two, four, six hours, they labored fervishly. Evening came and they continued to work eight, 10, 16 hours. When morning came, some quit tolling, headed and headed home. They argued, there are no survivors. There is only silence. There is no use in digging anymore. A handful stayed and worked 18, 20, 24 hours. Then they too left, but not Armand's father. Others urged him, you have to quit. You need some rest. Come with us. It's hopeless. Your son is dead. There is nothing you can do. No, he said. I told Armand I would come for him. Ignoring them and working by himself, Armand's father kept pulling off bricks and rubble, seeking his son and any other survivors. 30, 32, 34, 36 hours went by. He kept pulling rubble off the pile. Though others quit, he would not give up. Armand's dad refused to quit searching. Then, the 38th hour, as he heaved away a large piece of rubble, he heard voices. Armand, he screamed. A child's voice responded, Dad, it's me. Then he said, I told the other kids not to worry. I told them that if you were alive, you'd save me. And when you saved me, they'd be saved. You promised you would always be there for me. You did it, Dad. Moments later, their dad was helping his son, Armand, and 13 more frightened, hungry, and thirsty boys and girls climb out of the debris, free at last. When the building had collapsed, these children had been spared by a tent-like pocket. When the town pe townspeople praised Armand's dad, his explanation was, I promised my son, no matter what, I'd come for him. And the same is true for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus doesn't give up on us. He desires that we all come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. It's important that we don't give up on ourselves and that we don't give up on others. And most importantly, we don't give up on Christ. He's coming. Will you stand with me as we pray? Our gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. And we're thankful for you, God. Father, this morning I pray that you would help us not to give up. But Lord, you know we talked about the fine print. There are things that we do need to give up. And Lord, I'm not here to point them out, Father. You and each one of us can deal with that personally. 
And you know where we need to not give up. And you know where we do need to give up. And so, Lord, I just pray with all my heart, mind, and soul that you would help us to know the difference and help us to cling to you, the author and finisher of our faith. Father God, we love you. And I thank you for this time. And it's in your wonderful and holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.